please, in the second chapter. Revelation chapter 2 and beginning to read at verse number 8. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. We'll end the reading there. And we know the Lord and trust the Holy Spirit will give us good understanding of this portion of Scripture this morning. If you'll again just open your Bibles with me please to Revelation chapter 2. And verse number 8, we're going to finish off this morning uh, the Lord's letter to the church at Smyrna. And we're going to be focusing primarily with verses number 10 and verses number 11. And I suppose the greatest thing that has touched my heart as I have looked through the letter of the Lord to this little suffering assembly in Smyrna, probably the greatest thing has been the comfort of the Lord Jesus to suffering saints. Just how much the Lord really cares and just how much the Lord has entered in to all that they had suffered. And we saw not last week but the week before that the Lord Jesus not only knew by a knowledge of information by his omniscience what they were suffering but he also knew by an experiential knowledge, and that touched me, that whether it was tribulation, their pressure, or whether it was their poverty, or whether it was the problem of the blaspheming of the Jews, the Lord knew it, and the Lord had also experienced everything that they had experienced. But overarching these wonderful truths, that we have been thinking about, these practical truths, and these very comforting truths, is the very specific message or lesson that the Lord Jesus had for the assembly here at Smyrna. And do you remember the lesson that we had written over the church at Ephesus? It was labor without love. And that love for Christ was paramount. And then we find from the Lord's letter to the church at Smyrna is that if we are going to be marked with blessings, if we are going to receive the blessing of the Lord, we need to be those who are first marked by faithfulness. And so the Lord's letter and the Lord's lesson to the assembly at Smyrna and to us this morning in the meeting is that we need to be faithful and be marked by faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what we've already seen in our opening remarks of this letter is this. That although the Lord Jesus has comforted the saints, he is going to leave them in absolutely no doubt of the fate that awaits them. You see, he has comforted them in, in verse number 8. He said, I am the first and the last, or these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. He says to them, I have been through death. I know all about death. And he says, now I am alive. He was comforting them. 
But what we find is this, that before the saints in Smyrna, let's just say, we'll put it like this, receive the not so good news. Christ had already instilled into their hearts and lives that he was in control. That he was the one who was sovereign, sitting upon his throne. And that he was in control of all things. And so he comforts them in verse 8. I was dead and I'm alive. And he comforts them in verse 9. I know thy works, I know thy tribulation, I know thy poverty, I know the blasphemy of the Jews, which say they're Jews and are not, but they're the synagogue of Satan. He knew it, and he had experienced it. And speaking to many saints down through the years, they have often said to me, I know whenever the Lord is taking me through a time of testing or a time of tribulation, I can almost sense That there's a time of testing coming. Why? Because the Lord has been preparing me for it. Preparing me for it. And so in verses 8 and in verses 9, it is preparation for what the saints are about to face and what they're going to go through. And it is laid out in verse 10 and in verse 11. Look what it says in verse 10. It says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. You see, the Lord Jesus didn't say, fear none of those things because I am going to deliver you from the suffering and the tribulation. No. He says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Know of a surety. Know without a shadow of a doubt that you will go through persecution. You will go through suffering, but I want you to fear none of those things. And despite all the little assembly of faced with the pressure and with the poverty and with the problem, if you think this is bad, the Lord Jesus says things are going to get a whole lot worse. Look at verse 10. They're going to be cast into prison. Some of them are going to be tried. They're going to face tribulation ten days. And he says for many, many, it will end in death. End in death. And so I want you to see this morning, and this is going to be the thrust of our message. This is going to be the lesson that I want you to lay hold of this morning and make it good to yourself, is this. That when we face trials, and when we face times of testing, and when we face suffering, the devil is going to do everything in his power to make us feel. The devil wants us to let Christ down in our time of testing. The devil wants us to give up. The devil wants us to lose faith. The devil wants us to forget about putting our confidence in the Lord and putting our confidence in man. And so what we have is, and the challenge for us this morning is this, is to have the Sumerian spirit to be able to look up in our time of testing. To be marked with faithfulness, to be steadfast, to be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And whatever the devil might throw at us through troubles and through testings and through trials, to be found faithful for the Lord Jesus. And so what we're going to be thinking about this morning in these two verses, verses 10 and verse 11, is how the enemy is going to try and and ruin their testimony in their times of testing and trial. And so we're going to be considering how the enemy comes upon them in verses 10 and verse 11. Now I was thinking about some of the parallels in suffering in the scripture. And I pointed out last Lord's Day morning, two Lord's Day mornings ago, how these sufferings of the little assembly in Smyrna really parallel the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. And we saw that. We saw the pressure the Lord was under. We saw the poverty he faced. We saw the ridicule and the blaspheming of the Jews against him. 
But what we're going to see this morning is how a little parallel, not only between the Lord Jesus, but think about Job. I was thinking of Job. And I was thinking that Job would have fitted in very well in this little assembly in Smyrna because he faced some trying times. You see, you think of Job first of all. Job was an upright man. He was upright and he eschewed evil. And if you think about the saints in Smyrna, well, you could say the exact same thing. They were upright. They stood for uprightness. And because they stood for righteousness, they received persecution. We not only think about that little parallel, but you remember how it was God who, who really pointed Satan to Job. God turned to Satan and said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? It was God who pointed Job out to Satan for trial and for testing. And you remember that with regards to the little assembly at Smyrna, it was through the sovereign hand of God that allowed them to be persecuted and to go through these awful trials and testing. And then we not only think about that, but you remember how God allowed Job to touch Satan's body and to touch his business and to touch his bank account and to touch everything, but he wasn't allowed to kill him. But the saints in Smyrna were going to face tribulation ten days, and the Lord would allow them to die. But the big key thing about Job and the big key thing about Smyrna was this, is what it would be a test of Job's character. A test of Job's character. You remember on one occasion, Job's wife turned around to him and said, Job, just curse God and die. It literally means just, just blaspheme God and commit suicide. And Job turned around to his wife and said, Shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord and not receive evil? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And we find when we come to the end of Job chapter 41, we find that Job's character showed that after his testing and after his trial, he was purified and God blessed him with more than he had at the beginning. And what we read of the saints in Smyrna was this, that they will be tried. They will be tried. And so what we find is, is that God is going to try us. He's going to test us, our love, our character, our faithfulness to him. And we are going to see some of the tactics that the devil is going to use this morning through tribulations and trials in order to make us feel in our walk with Christ. Now I want you to look at verse 10 and grasp what the Lord Jesus is saying here. He says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Notice the, the wording of the language. It says, fear not, behold the devil. You see, it doesn't say, fear not, behold evil men shall cast you into prison. No, it says, fear not, behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison. And you will notice if you've been reading the letter of the Lord this morning very, very quickly, we get two names or two titles of the enemy in this letter. We have seen him already as Satan. And now we're seeing him as the devil. And whenever you read Satan in your Bible, you will read him as the opposer. As the one who stands against. As the adversary. And the reason why the Lord Jesus said that the little synagogue there in, in Smyrna had become the synagogue of Satan. It was because Satan through the Jews was standing against, he was opposing the Christians. So if Satan means adversary, opposer, one who stands against, well whenever we read about him coming as the devil, it tells us that he is the accuser or the slanderer. So when you read Satan, it has something to do with his actions, what he is doing. But when you read about the devil, it's not so much his actions, but it's what he's saying. And the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He is the slanderer of God. And what we find is this, is that as the devil was slandering and as the devil was accusing, he was doing all this 
in order to separate and to divide, because that's what devil means. One who falsely accuses and divides without reason. Now, I want you to pick up just for a moment here. Sit up in your seat, and I want you really to listen to this. And I'm saying that just so you'll take notice. The word devil that is used here is the word diablos, right? And one of the words that is used in this connection word of diablos is the verb which means to throw or to cast. And so what we find with regards to the devil is this, that what he was doing was he was casting or he was throwing either himself or something between two in order to separate. And we can see that coming out in the verse. Look what it says in verse 10. It's almost as if the Lord Jesus was telling him what the word devil actually meant. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. That's what devil means. To cast. To throw. To get between. To try and separate. And the devil thought by casting the saints into prison and by having them tried and putting them under tribulation And putting them under pressure and facing death, it would break them down. And they would get their eyes off Christ and they would get their eyes off the Lord. And they would fail in their time of suffering and in their time of tribulation. But we see that it had the reverse. The woes in Smyrna, well, they were faithful. And they stood for Christ. And how was the devil going to get them cast into prison? Well, by slander and by act. Do you know, I was thinking, this is awful. The believers didn't need this. The believers' backs were already against the wall. And you know, the little saying is said, it's true of the enemy. The enemy loves to kick you when you're down. And when the enemy had got them down by the tribulation and by the poverty and by the accusations and the opposition of the Jews, he just stood on them. And he tried to drive them down into the ground as far as he could. Do you know, brothers and sisters, this morning, the greatest thing that the devil can do, the worst thing that the devil can do, is death. That's the worst thing we will face in life, is death. But you can see how the Lord Jesus has already said to the saints at Smyrna, don't be afraid, I have overcome death. And so really, there's not one thing in this life that we should be afraid of. Whether it be death, or whether it be persecution, the Lord is always in control. You see, the devil is trying to get between the believers by casting them either into jail or letting them face death. But I realize this morning, brothers and sisters, for those of you in the meeting, it could be something quite different for you. You see, everything that we face and every trial that we go through, we find that the devil will be doing absolutely everything in his power in order to make us fall. He will do absolutely everything in his power to drive a wedge in between us and God in order that we might take our eyes off Christ and look at our situations and look at our problems. The enemy is a subtle foe. And so the one who casts, he's trying to drive something in between us and God. Maybe he's trying to make you blame God for something. Maybe he's trying to make you blame yourself. Maybe he's trying to get you to look at your own situations and your own problems and take your eyes off the Lord. He's casting something between you and God. And I realize this morning it could be a worry. It could be a doubt. It could be a fear. It could be a lie. But don't let the enemy be subtle in your life this morning. And try and get your eyes and your focus fixed upon the Lord Jesus. You see, I was thinking about the devil and it took my mind right back to to the Garden of Eden again. And I asked myself the question, what was it that the devil had cast in the Garden of Eden between Adam and Eve? Well, it was a lie and it was a doubt. 
He said to Adam and Eve, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He cast in between Adam and Eve and God a lie and a doubt in order to turn them away from God, that they would lose their faithfulness to God. And the devil put himself between Adam and Eve and God. And so I want you to grasp this this morning about the enemy's tactics. When you go through suffering and when you go through trials, he will do everything in his power to get between you and God. To separate you from him. He can never take your salvation. Don't worry about that. But he can steal your joy. The devil comes not but to kill your peace. To steal your joy. And to destroy your testimony. And he knows if he can get between you and God. When you go through that time of suffering. You go through that time of trial. He will close you in. He will try to block out the light of God's word. You see I was thinking about Elijah. You remember Elijah there? He went a day's journey out into the wilderness and he sat under the juniper tree depressed. And what did the devil do? The devil got between Elijah and God. And Elijah couldn't see the light of God's word and couldn't see the light of God's glory. And he said, Lord, just kill me now. He's depressed. And so I want you to be sure this morning that when you go through times of trials and times of testing, do not let the devil get between you and God. And you be careful and you be wary of the devil's devices. Because Paul tells us we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And so the devil hates every child of God. He wants to see you fall. He wants to see you fail. And we can see that in the next phrase. Fear none of those things which I shall suffer, verse 10. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. That ye may be tried. Now, if the devil is the one that is doing the casting, if the devil is the one that is casting him into prison, if he's the one that's behind all this, well, then the enemy, the devil, is the one that is doing the trying. And what this shows us from the word of God is this, is that God is in sovereign control. And really the enemy, the devil, is nothing more than a puppet on a string. And God is using him in his own sovereign purpose for the blessing and for the refining of the child of God in suffering and in trials. And we saw that in the life of Job. Now I want you to turn back with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 13. Just turn back, it's only a few pages in your Bible. If you come to Hebrews, you've gone too far. But James chapter 1 and verse 13. And I want you to put this verse in your mind. Whenever you go through trials or sufferings or testings or temptation, put this verse in your mind and it vindicates God. And it will let you see the glory of God in the time of testing. Look what it says. James chapter 1 verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. That word tempted there is the exact same word in Revelation 2 and verse 10, tried. Tried. And so you could read the word tried into verse 13. Let no man say when he is tried, I am tried of God. For God cannot be tried with evil, neither trieth he any man. So God is not the one that is trying. God is not the one that is tempting. The one that is trying and the one that is tempting is the devil. God is using him in his own sovereign purpose and plan. You see, a temptation, in the idea of the word temptation, is designed in order to see what is in us, to see how we will react. And you will find that that is exactly what the word temptation means, or tried means. It means to place someone in a situation to see how they will react in that temptation or in that trial. Will they crumble under the pressure or will they turn out of the pressure and look up and give the glory to God? 
It wouldn't be a temptation if it wasn't trying us. And so God in these times of testing and in these times of trial, just with Job and just with the saints in Smyrna, they were being placed in a situation to see what was in them. And as the devil looked upon them, he was hoping with all of his might and all of his heart that when they were placed into that temptation or that trial, they would feel God. I was thinking of the saints. Maybe they were standing there. There was a mother and father standing in prison. And there was the little children standing before them with a Roman soldier with a knife in his hand and a blade around the child's neck. And them saying to the parents, go on, deny Christ. Well, let your children live. And the devil standing there rubbing his hands and saying, oh, well, I'm trying them, I'm tempting them. Maybe they'll feel God. Maybe they'll deny the name of Christ. And them saying, no, even if we lose it all, we will be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they lost their children. Brothers and sisters, that's faithfulness to the Lord Jesus. And so the temptation or the trial that we have before us here is to see what is in man. To put us in a certain situation, to put us in a certain drama of life, to see how we will cope. Will we crumble under the pressure? Or will we give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ? I was thinking of a few examples. We thought about Job, and we found he was victorious. You think of Joseph. It was the providence of God that put Joseph in the pit, wasn't it? It was the providence of God that sold Joseph into Egyptian slavery, wasn't it? It was the providence of God that made him do all the service in Potiphar's house, wasn't it? But it was satanically inspired temptation to lie with Potiphar's wife. It wasn't God that tempted him to do it. It was the devil. And when Joseph was tried, tempted, he was found to be pure. You think on the opposite hand, think of David. Instead of being in the battle, David was in his bed. And when David was tried, what happened to him this time? He failed. He gave the enemies of God an opportunity to blaspheme. In his time of trial and his time of testing, he lost his testimony. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this morning, the greatest thing that you possess on this earth is your testimony. And once you ruin your testimony, you will find it very, very, very hard to get it back. And be sure in your time of testing and your time of trial, you keep your testimony for Christ. And so one of the tryings proved to be a man's strength. The other one of the tryings proved to be a man's weakness. Just to show you that it's not always connected with immorality with regards to David and Joseph, think of Abraham. Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, it's the exact same word, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And when he was tried, he came through for Christ. He came through for God. And in this instance, it was God trying Abraham's obedience. And he brought glory to God. So you can see the idea of this word tried. And what the saints at Smyrna would face. And what you might face. That when you're tried, the devil is putting something in between you and God. And he's putting you in a position to see how you will react. To see if you'll bring glory to God. Or to see if you will destroy your testimony. And he is standing by with his hands rubbed together. Hoping that when you are tried you will fall. Be not ignorant of the Satan's and of the devil's devices. And when the saints at Smyrna were tried. It proved to be their strength. Smyrna. Myrrh. They brought out a wonderful fragrance to God. And without a doubt. One day. It may be soon, it may be later, it may have passed. Your faith will be tried. And I want you to look up. And I want you to realize that the enemy standing by and he's hoping that you'll fall. Don't give him an opportunity to blaspheme the name of God. But in your trial and in your testing, stand faster, Christ. And glory in it. Why? Because it proves that we are sons. 
Hebrews 12 and 6 says, Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son in whom he receives. It proves that we are sons of the living God. And so don't let the devil make you fall in your time of testing. Now come back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10. Look what it says. We're moving on to the next phrase. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, hoping that they'll fall. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Now I want you to see, first of all, that this little phrase, tribulation ten days, first of all, has a literal meaning. A very literal meaning. You see, we can see the Lord's grace in writing to these saints at Smyrna. Because he's meeting them at the very point of their need. Strong alongside them. Everything that he's saying to them has an application and a relevance to them in that exact need that they're in and specific trial that they face. He wouldn't be Christ if he didn't. And he says, you shall have tribulation ten days. And it's the Lord's grace. It was a specific period. Ten days. It would be no less than ten days. It would be no more than ten days. It would be ten days. And I reminded myself during the week of that wonderful little phrase or verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. And it says concerning the grace of God in a trial or in a temptation or in a test. And these are the exact same words as tried. There hath no temptation taken you but such is common to man. For God is faithful. And so because God is faithful, he wants us to be faithful. Do you know, if you'd have read this verse to the, to the saints at Smyrna, they would have put their arms around you. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. For God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, tried, above that which you're able but will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye might be able to bear it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you will never face a trial. You will never face a test. You will never face a suffering where God knows that you would not be able to bear it. God knows what you can bear. And I was speaking to my wife last night and we were thinking about certain things that children of God go through. And I said to her, you know, if I went through some of those things, I don't think I could bear it. And you know, she said, well, you would just have to bear it. And you mightn't think you can bear it, but you know, the Lord knows what you can bear. And you will never face a trial or a testing or a temptation where the Lord knows that you couldn't bear up under the weight of it. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. For God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tried above that which you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape, that ye might be able to bear it. And so we can see the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in these saints in Smyrna. They would not suffer a temptation above that which they could bear. Ten days. And you know, brothers and sisters, we can apply this to ourselves this morning. And we can say that these trials and tests will not last forever. That the Lord will bring us through the other side. I know for some of you in the meeting this morning, it's been longer than 10 days. But the Lord will bring you through. And when you look back, you will see the hand of God and His blessing on all the ups and all the downs. And know that He loves you with an everlasting love. But there's also a prophetical aspect here. Because we've not only been going through the letters and looking at the literal aspect and looking at the local aspect and looking at the historical aspect, but I want to just say something very quickly about the prophetical aspect. We have already said that the church to Ephesus is the first 100 years of church, church age history. And now when we come to Smyrna, it's going to be the next 142 years of church history. And what we find when we delve into church history, we find this. That on the year 286 AD, an emperor came to the throne by the name of Diocletian. And this emperor hated Christianity with a vehement hatred. And what he done was in the year 303 AD, he wrote he, he a letter or made a bill condemning all Christianity. 
That if there was anyone who was found who was a Christian, they were to be killed. End of story. Christian, find, throw him to the lions. Christian, find, burn him at the stake. Christian, find, throw him into prison, cut off his head. And he made it law that anyone who professed the name of Christ was to be killed. He closed meetings. He destroyed churches. He removed overseers. He threw people in prison. He burned and destroyed Bibles. He even proclaimed and pronounced that he would wipe Christianity off the very face of the earth. Diocletian. Christians lost property. They were put in exile. They faced death. And what we find prophetically is this, is that that period lasted ten years. Ye shall have tribulation ten days. And so prophetically, the church knew that there was going to be these ten years of persecution. And you know when it stopped? It stopped in the year 313, ten years after he had made this pronouncement to condemn Christianity, when a man came to the throne by the name of Constantine, who professed to be a Christian. And we're going to be looking at this when we come to the church at Pergamos. That the Christians would no longer face persecution from without. But they were going to face something that was far more subtle, and that was persecution from within. And Constantine professed to be a Christian. And we will find the whole marriage of the church with the state, and the whole mixed marriage business, and the foundation of the comings of the Church of Rome, and all the things that have infiltrated Christianity down through the years. Ye shall have tribulation ten days. So it's not only literal, but it's prophetical. Now very, very quickly, let us finish off by looking at verse number 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. This is the personal part of the letter. The individual part to the overcomer. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now ye listening. There was something for the assembly. Now there's something for the individual. You say to me, first of all, preacher, what's this second death? Are you telling me this morning that a man or a woman can die twice? Well, I'm telling you this morning on the basis and of the authority of God's word, a man or woman can die twice. And if you're in the meeting this morning not saved, one day you're going to die. And if you're not saved, you'll end up in hell. And we know from the word of God that the Lord Jesus is going to come back and he's going to set everything straight. He's going to put it all in order. The Lord Jesus is going to deal with the world through the seven years of tribulation. And while he's dealing with the world through the seven years of tribulation, he'll be dealing with the saints in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. And then when the seven years have run its course, Christ will come back to earth in power and great glory and he'll set up a thousand year kingdom. And when the thousand years are ended, he will lift all those men and women out of hell that have rejected Christ and stand before him at the judgment seat, the judgment throne, the great white throne, judgment throne. And they will be reunited, body, soul and spirit, not for reward, but for judgment and for damnation. Now turn over with me quickly to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11. Let's read it. Let's take the time to read it. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works, their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And we could repeat it again. This is the second death. Unsafe friend in the meeting this morning, you'll die once. But if you're not saved, you'll die again. And this time you'll not be cast into hell. 
but you'll be cast into the lake of fire. Face a second death. And so what is the declaration of Christ to the overcomer? He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. I hope you praise God this morning. That every one of you in the meeting that are saved by grace will not stand before the great white throne judgment seat of God. You'll never be here. Because Christ died for your sin upon the cross and he removed that sin, you will never face God's awful judgment and the second death. You'll die once, but then you'll go to glory. And just on close with regards to the second death, I was thinking about this and looking at it just through the week in, in human history. And historians tell us that some of the Roman amphitheaters that held some of their games had thousands upon thousands of spectators. Some of the Roman amphitheaters held up with upwards in anything of 20 to 25,000 people. And what we find is that these spectators who came to watch the games, as the games were drawing to a close, that was when the Christians were brought out to be crucified and to be slain and to be fed to the lions and to be killed in an awful way. And the light would start to fade and those who came out to watch the games, boredom would start to set in and then they would bring the Christians out. And maybe one of the generals would cry out, light the lights. And what would be the source of lighting? Round the amphitheater, would be Christians tied to poles elevated into the air, daubed in a flammable liquid, and set on fire. That was the mode of lighting. And I can see as the Christians are upon the poles and daubed in flammable liquid, ready to be set on fire, I can see a brother turning round to the other one and saying, Fear not, my friend. They might burn us in this life with flames. But we will not be burnt with the flames of the second death. Can you see it? And I was thinking, just to think the ones that held the torches to God's choicest saints, to burn them alive, will one day if they do not get saved, or one day if they haven't been saved, will be burned with a flame more terrible than the Christians ever faced. The flames of the second death. You know, no matter what the devil threw between these saints and Smyrna and God, they came out victorious. Not even death could separate them from the love of God. Not even death could make them give up their position in Christ. And brothers and sisters, I want you to see this morning that they were victorious in suffering, and the Lord gave them a crown of life. And so we have to leave it there this morning, but we trust this morning that you'll have learned the lesson of the Lord Jesus to the assembly at Smyrna. Faithfulness. Faithfulness in a time of testing. And let us ask ourselves the question, are we faithful in our walk and in our life to the Lord Jesus? Let's bow in a wee quick word of prayer. Father, we thank thee again for thy word this morning. We thank thee, Father, that the Lord Jesus loves us with an everlasting love. We thank you, Father, this morning for those in the meeting who are overcomers. We will not be hurt of the second death. We praise your Father, that the Lord Jesus has died for sin and died for sinners and has risen again and is a living Savior and able to save all who come unto God through him. And so, Father, we pray that in these last days, the lesson we would learn from the Lord's letter to Smyrna, faithfulness to Christ in a time of testing. And help us, our God, to be faithful to thee in whatever avenue or aspect of life thou hast called us to, for thy glory and for thy honor, in whose name we pray. Amen.